That wasn't too bad. That was nice. Good to be with you all this morning. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, I was just saying to a couple of brothers before uh, we started this, this morning that it must be between 15 and 20 years since I've been in this building. Uh, I was in the other building a number of times, but I've only been in here once. So it's great to be back with you again. And uh, again, thank you for being here. And we pray that God will bless us as we've met together this morning. I think I've now got my children's talk for next week. So thank you for that as well. I appreciate that. And uh, I might even use some of the illustrations that you used as well. So that was great. But uh, it is lovely to be with you. And we just pray for God's blessing to be upon us this morning. So just before we come to God's word, let's just bow for a word of prayer. Our blessed God and loving eternal heavenly Father, we thank Thee once again for Your grace, Your mercy, Your goodness and faithfulness toward us. We thank You, Father, that each of us have been given gifts and talents that You have granted us so that we might use them for Your honor and glory and so that we, Lord, might bring glory and praise to Your name. And we pray, Father, that we would use what You have given us and, Father, that You would be delighted and pleased with us as we would seek to serve Thee. We pray, Lord, now that as we come to Thy Word, that You would give us an understanding of it. This is Thy Word. It's a spiritual book, and we need Thy Holy Spirit to teach us. And, Lord, we thank You that we, each of us can read the same passage, and yet Your Holy Spirit can reveal different applications to each one of us. And, Lord, we pray that as we would hear Thy Word this morning, that You would speak to our hearts by Your Spirit, instruct us, guide us, and teach us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would leave knowing that we have heard the voice of our God this morning. We pray, Father, that the only person seen today will be the Lord Jesus Christ. And, Father, we'll give you all the praise and all the glory for every blessing we receive. For we ask it in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Now, in a moment, we're going to be reading a, a verse from Matthew chapter 9, please. Matthew chapter 9. I'm sure nearly everyone has at some time seen the wee yellow smiley face symbol. But not a lot of people are aware of where it came from. An insurance company in Massachusetts in 1963 had a serious morale problem uh, among its staff. And so they called in a graphic designer called Harvey Ball to design something that would brighten up the workplace and pick up morale among the staff. And his solution was a simple smiley face on a yellow background. And the rest, as they say, is history. But today there seems to be a severe morale problem globally. Not just in one insurance company, but it's hard to find in the world today anything to be cheerful about. The politics are in a complete mess worldwide. We don't seem to have the statesmen that we used to have. It used to be that even unpopular politicians had an air of gravitas about them. They had a sense of responsibility uh, regarding their position. But today's parliamentarians seem to be filled with, uh, the, the parliament seem to be filled with rows of amateurs. Liberal amorality has taken on, taken on an increasingly bizarre and aggressive tone. The agenda is illogical, it's utter nonsense, and yet it's being swallowed by much of the public hook, line, and sinker, and it's hammered home by the high priests of liberalism in the media. Parents are being sidelined in the raising of their own children. Traditional standards are being considered as abusive and unacceptable. Having a moral opinion is considered to be un-British nowadays, and society's dismissing God and the Bible as irrelevant. Families are falling apart. Sickness and disease is reaching epidemic proportions. Natural disasters are a weekly news item. And despite the aim of the United Nations and other similar bodies to eradicate conflict, conflict is as certain today as death and taxes. We could be forgiven for thinking, what on earth is there to be cheerful about? In fact, it's got to the stage now that anyone who has a cheerful disposition on their face is looked on as more than a little bit strange. We're looking 
forward into a relatively new year. It's only the second Sunday of 2018. Now, whenever you got to the 1st of January and you looked out the window, the sun wasn't any brighter in the sky and the birds weren't singing any more sweetly in the trees and, and, and things weren't just suddenly more pleasant and more positive. We hadn't just suddenly forgotten all of our regrets from the previous year. Really, things are just moseying along the way they always have done. But whenever we come into a new year, it has given us the opportunity to reassess, to, to try to readjust and look into the future, and, and just to take stock and to evaluate and to make adjustments to our patterns and to our mindset. Uh, and as we do that, it's good to be reminded that if anyone has the right and the privilege to be cheerful, it's the child of God. And this morning, I want us to see that three truths that give us reason to be cheerful. And they all come with this phrase in Scripture, be of good cheer. And the first one we find in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 2. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 2. It says, And behold, they brought to him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. Folks, we, have, we can be of good cheer this morning because our sins have been forgiven. Our sins have been forgiven. I'm not going to be trying to complicate anything this morning. I want just some three very simple truths. And the first one is that our sins have been forgiven. Now, if we look at the language that's used here, in the Greek, it's something called the perfect indicative passive tense. Now, don't you worry one bit about what that means. Basically, all that it means is that when the Lord Jesus is saying here, thy sins be forgiven thee, he's looking at something that has already happened but the effects are still felt in the present. Folks, your sins have been forgiven thee. And the effects of that forgiveness continue to the present. You remain forgiven in the present. You will continue to be forgiven in the future. But isn't it hard to live in the reality of that, of knowing that our sins are forgiven? A vicar had a dream once that he was on his way to heaven. And before him there stretched a long flight of stairs. And as he started to go up, he was given a piece of chalk. And he was told that he had to put a chalk mark on every step for each sin that he had ever committed. When he was about halfway up, he met a bishop coming down again. And he asked the bishop why he was returning. The bishop answered, I'm just going back to get more chalk. And isn't that how we feel sometimes about our sin? We're haunted by past sins. The devil keeps dragging up into our minds the mistakes and the blunders that we've made. We're badgered by the memory of hurt that we have caused or damage that we have inflicted or that others have inflicted upon us. We're silenced by the shame of sins that were committed in private or in public whether seen or unseen by human eyes but the shame just won't let us go even though we've confessed them, even though we've repented of them, we still feel the shame of those sins. That's when you need to hear the words again, be of good cheer. My sins have been forgiven me. If you're a child of God, your sins are already forgiven. You're not unsaved again when you sin. You may have lost fellowship with God until you've confessed that sin and repented of it but you have never lost your salvation. Your sins are forgiven you. The moment that you got saved was the moment that your debt of sin was forgiven. Yes, it was paid for on Calvary. But the moment that you gave your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, the price that was paid on Calvary became the price that was paid on your behalf and you were saved. Your sins were completely at that moment forgiven for eternity. Never to be held against you ever again. You took what Jesus did on Calvary and you made it your own by faith. 
Now, there will always be those daily transgressions, always be those daily iniquities that need to be addressed if we're going to maintain fellowship with the holy God. But the root cause has been forgiven, and you are now accepted by God. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 6 and 7, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. The forgiveness of sins means that we are now accepted before God. Abraham Lincoln was interviewed by someone right before the end of the American Civil War. The reporter said to him, what are you going to do to those rebellious Southerners after the war is over? How are you going to treat them when they come back to the United States? And Lincoln replied, I will treat them as if they had never been away. And folks, that's the reason why God can show kindness and grace to us. That's why He can call us His children, because simply He treats us as if we had never been away from Him. That's what justification is. Just as if I had never sinned. Whenever God looks upon you as a saved person, He doesn't see you as a saved sinner. He sees you as His child, pure and simple. Yes, we know that we're saved sinners. We know that we're sinners saved by grace. But Jesus Christ, God the Father, looks upon you simply as His child, as one who has never sinned as far as He is concerned, because Jesus took it all. Like the South in the American Civil War, we were enemies against the legitimate authority in the universe. We were rebels against God, and we were defeated. We were doomed. But the one who condemned us, is the one who also provided acceptance and forgiveness and salvation for us through the only begotten Son, no matter what events are happening in the world. We can be of good cheer because we know that our sins have been forgiven. It's not something to praise the Lord for. Our sins have been forgiven. We are right with God. Our debt of sin is paid. Our condemnation has been lifted. We've passed from darkness into light. We've passed from the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Let it get a hold of your heart. Let it grasp you. Let it enfold you in this wonderful truth. Your sins are, be are forgiven. Again, as Paul said in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Folks, I hope you're rejoicing in sins forgiven this morning. I hope whenever we're singing these wonderful hymns that you're singing them with joy in your heart, with thankfulness in your spirit, because your sins are forgiven. You're no longer under condemnation. You're no longer heading for a Christless eternity in hell. You're heading for glory, and nothing is going to stop you from getting there, because your sins have been forgiven. I look down sometimes. Now, I can only speak from Coke, because I haven't been here long enough yet. But I, can, I look down sometimes, and I see people singing. And you'd think that they were singing about their tax returns. Happiness is the Lord. And they've got a big frown on their face and everything else. And you think it was the worst thing in the world to sing to the Lord about being saved. Folks, it's the best thing in the world. It's wonderful to be saved. And whenever people come in to our churches, and they see the Christians singing hymns. Let them see them singing hymns with joy on their faces. I know sometimes it's hard to sing a song with a smile on your face at the same time. I know some people can't do it. Maybe the woman can do it better because they're better at multitasking. But we can try. And if our faces contort into some strange face while we're trying to do it, so what? At least they can see the joy of the Lord on our face. Be of good cheer. Because your sins have been forgiven. But something else, let's turn over into chapter 14 of Matthew. Matthew chapter 14. Our, we can be of good cheer because our sins are forgiven, but we can be of good cheer because Jesus is with us in our storms. Jesus is with us in our storms. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22. 
It says, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him in, unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. It's a ghost, they were saying. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Those are beautiful words, aren't they? Be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Here were the disciples in a storm. Now, where were they? It says that they were in the midst of the sea. It was as easy to go forward as it was to go back. There was no easy way to the shore. They were right in the midst of the sea. What were the conditions like? It says the wind was contrary. It was always changing. Isn't that what we feel sometimes whenever we're dealing with issues in life? We're just starting to get a hold of one situation that's cropped up in our life, and bam, something else hits you from another direction. It was dark. It says that it was the fourth watch of the night. That's between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning. Why do we always have this idea that it was daylight whenever this storm was happening and Jesus was walking in the water? Because that's what the flannel graph showed us, isn't it? It was the middle of the night, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. It was dark. They could barely see one another, let alone the Lord Jesus out on the waves in front of them. Even if they had oil lamps, it would have been dangerous to light them. They were in a storm. They wouldn't have wanted fire on the boat. The clouds were covering the moonlight. They couldn't see the way ahead or behind. Uh, and again, isn't that how we feel whenever we get into trials and trouble in life? How did I get here? How am I going to get out of this? Where am I going? What does the Lord want us to do in this? Why did the Lord bring us into this situation? And that leads us as to why they were in the storm. Look at what it says here in verse 22. And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him onto the other side. They were there because Jesus put them there. Folks, we need to remember that whatever situation we have to face in our lives, we're there because Jesus puts us there. We're there because the Lord has allowed it to happen. God will not allow anything to happen to you that you can't handle in His strength. There is nothing that you have to face that's beyond your ability to handle with the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. A preacher by the name of, I think this is a brilliant name, Shadrach Meshach Lockridge. It's a good thing he didn't have two middle names, Shadrach Meshach Abednego Lockridge. But he took us his text one night, Psalm 23 and verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But he had spent the entire message preaching on the words, The Lord is. You see, whenever Jesus said here, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. That we, those three wee words that we have in the King James, it is I. Do you know what it literally means? It means I am. It means I am. They were reminding the disciples, he was reminding the disciples that he is God. In the midst of our storms, God is still God. In the midst of our storms, the Lord Jesus Christ that is with you and will never leave you nor forsake you, he's still God. You know, the Lord Jesus said to his disciples again, These things have, I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. You imagine that storm. Imagine the waves reaching 10 or 20 feet high and the boat rising up onto the crest of a wave and then crashing down again suddenly as the waves give way beneath it and the wind trying to tip that boat over onto its other side. And now imagine Jesus walking toward his disciples on top of the water. Do you think that he was climbing up one wave and sliding down the next one like, like some expert surfer? I don't think so, because he has overcome the world. I believe every step that the Lord Jesus took was onto water that was perfectly calm. 
Yes, the storm was raging around him, and perhaps the stormy water splashed him in the face, but his steps were calm and steady, sure and unstaken. His steps were level and unwavering. He was walking on the water, not ankle deep in the water. He was on the water. He had overcome the storm. Even while the water was boiling around him and the sky was thundering, he had overcome it. As the Lord Jesus said, in the world ye shall have tribulation. Trouble is absolutely certain. Job said, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. And folks, the trouble that you and I have to face is sanctioned by the Lord. He may not be the source of the trouble, but He is the controller of it. He sanctions or prohibits according to what is best for us and what is best for His glory. And the trouble that comes in this wicked world, it's inevitable, but Christ has overcome the world. And that means that the trouble that we face is subservient to Christ's ultimate authority. Now, you may look at me and say, what sort of trouble do you have? She only work one day a week. I hear that all the time. About nine years ago, I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. It's a type of arthritis type of thing. I have to take injections every two weeks to try to keep it under control. There are times I've been preaching from a stool in the pulpit because I could, literally couldn't stand. About a year and a half ago, I had a heart attack. Ended up in hospital. It was funny because that night I was planning to speak from Psalm 23, he maketh me lie down. Not off. <laughs> Why does that trouble come? My wife has said to me, she's looked at other people who are maybe slightly bigger than I am, and I said, well, how come you're the one who had the heart attack and not them? Because the Lord wanted me to have it. Simple as that. I got a stent then, and then that summer of 2016, I ended up back in Craig Alvin Area Hospital again with unstable angina. I had to get two more stents in. I was in the hospital for a week and a half, but the, while I was in the hospital, a young fellow from our church was in hospital, not able to walk. He had been diagnosed with a tumor in his back that was attached onto his kidney. And it had been there so long that blood vessels had formed around it. It was putting pressure on the main vein leading back to his heart. But he couldn't get out of bed. Do you know which ward he was put in? The ward on the opposite side of the building from me. And every day I was able to walk around to him, spend time with him and encourage him. If I hadn't had to go back in, if they hadn't missed the other blockage the first time I was in. I wouldn't have been in hospital. I wouldn't have been able to encourage him like that. God knew what he was doing. Brother in Cumberbap, the Stuart Burnham, had a heart attack about four weeks ago. I've been able to call him and talk to him and tell him what my experiences are to try to help him and encourage him. And tell him the Lord has the whole thing under control. Folks, God has a reason. His glory is paramount. Our temporary trouble means nothing in the grand scheme of things. God has a purpose in it all. And since we will face trials and troubles, Jesus makes sure that, he, that we only face what we can handle in His strength. But it gets better because in the trial, Jesus says to us with all of the love and tenderness in His heart, be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. I read a story that's both heartbreaking and beautiful. The story is about a boy who had a terminal illness. And one night he was especially quiet and his mother asked him what was bothering him. I don't know about you, but if one of my children said this to me, I don't know how I would hold it in. He said, Mother, what's it like to die? Does it hurt? 
She was quiet for a moment and then she said, son, do you remember how when you used to play so hard all day that when night came you'd be too tired to undress and get into bed? You would sometimes fall asleep on the sofa in the living room and when you woke up in the morning, you'd be surprised to find yourself in your own little bed, in your own room, and you were there because someone loved you. And your father had come with his big strong arms and he carried you into your own room and put you into your own bed. Mother went on to say, death's like that. We just wake up some morning to find ourselves in another room, our own room where we really belong. Because the Lord Jesus loved us so much that he's preparing a place for us and he will come and take us there. If that's the love and care that God shows us at death, how much less do we need to fear the troubles in the world? But only for a moment. Turn over for a moment, please, into 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16. <clears throat> Second Corinthians chapter four and verse sixteen. Paul writes here and he says, For all sorry, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You see, when he writes here about our light affliction, that word light, it means weightless. Something that's just a, it's a, it's a trifle, it's fluff, it's whimsy. There's no substance to it. And he says that it's momentary. It's but for a moment. It's temporal, it's a blip. One commentator puts it like this. He says, pain is pain, and suffering is suffering, and a scar is a scar, and a rock is a rock, and a rod is a rod, a whip is a whip, and defamation of character is defamation of character, and assassination of someone's integrity is that pain is real, suffering is real. We admit it's real. We don't deny its reality. What Paul says we deny is that it matters. It is real, but it isn't important. It's a trivial annoyance on one hand. It's light and momentary. And then on the other hand, it's far more than that because it's producing for us an eternal weight of glory. It is having a positive effect. Physical suffering, defamation, disappointment, all the things ma the man suffered were producing something. It's producing an eternal weight of glory. It means a mass of it, something heavy that tips the scale. And the, he finishes with this. He says, the scale is tipped in favor of that which is in the future rather than that which is in the present. He says, I'll take the present pain. Folks, when we're going through difficulties, it seems like it's such a great burden. It seems like it's so difficult and so hard. And yes, it is but it's nothing compared to the glory which will be revealed in us when we get to heaven. What is it that makes it bearable? It's the presence of the Lord. Jesus said to his disciples in the midst of a raging storm, it is I, be not afraid. He says, I am. And I am is an unfinished statement. It means that Jesus as God is everything you will ever need. When you're weak, God says, I am your strength. When you're sorrowing, he says, I am your comfort. When you're ashamed, he says, I am your father and your salvation. When you're nervous, he says, I am your shield. When you're frustrated, he says, I am your peace. 
When you're lonely, he says, I am your friend and I'll stick closer to you than a brother. When you're sad, he says, I am your joy. When you're worried, he says, I am your hope. In any storm, any trial, any difficulty of life, Jesus says to you, be of good cheer. It is I. Be not afraid. We can be of good cheer because our sins have been forgiven and because Jesus is with us in our storms. And finally, because God knows and plans the future. Acts chapter 27, please. Acts 27. Because God knows and plans the future. Acts 27 and verse 25. Here there's an instance of another storm that Paul had to face. He's on his way to Rome. And this storm is, again, a severe one. You're a Clyden. It's even got a name. And in verse 25, Paul says to the others on the boat, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Paul was speaking to ungodly men but he was speaking with such confidence and absolute assurance that they follow his lead and follow God's commands. And the result was that even though the ship was lost after getting beached on Malta, there was no loss of life just as God had said. In our own place, we have spent some time thinking of prophetic things. We've spent about four weeks on Sunday mornings thinking of prophesying. But the fact is, folks, Jesus is coming again. He's coming back. He's coming for me and for you if you're saved. And if we have to pass through death, it will be absent from the body and present with the Lord. Now, people who believe what we believe about the second coming and the rapture were sometimes criticized for not preparing Christians for the tribulation. I'll tell you why I don't prepare Christians for the tribulation. Because there will be no church age Christians in the tribulation. Will not be there. I believe God. And God says in His Word that we are not appointed unto wrath. I believe God who says that the dead in Christ shall rise. I believe God who says that we shall all be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. I believe God who said that the Lord Jesus Christ would lose none of those that are His. I believe God who said that those who hear Christ's voice and follow Him shall never perish. And whenever anyone challenges you about what you believe, all you need to say to them is, I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. Because God's not only aware of the future, He has it planned. Numbers 23 and 19 says, God is, a, is not a man that he should lie, neither the Son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Paul said to, second, to, to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1 and 12, I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Folks, we can be of good cheer, because our sins have been forgiven. We can be of good cheer because Jesus Christ is with us in every storm of life. We can be of good cheer this morning because God knows and plans our future. And our future is with Him in glory. Let that put a smile on your face. Let that put a song in your heart. Remember that God loves you. With every fiber of His being, He loves you. He cares for you. He wants what's best for you. Folks, we have no reason to be going around like a lurking spade. I know we're a bit further south than lurking, but you know what I mean. We can go around with a smile on our face all the time. Let people call us strange if we want. But we belong to God. Be of good cheer. Amen. We're going to sing in closing, please. Number 659.